Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to our talk, I guess. Uh, my name's Tom. I'm a solutions engineer at Jetstack. Um, I've been working with Kubernetes now, which is kind of scary, I guess like three or four years. Yeah, three years or so. Um, I promise, I don't, still don't claim to be an expert, uh, but I work for a consultancy called Jetstack. Um, so we at least try and help people doing Kubernetes. Um, fail a lot along the way, but you know that's all part of the process. I'm joined here by my colleague, Josh. Um, yeah, hi everyone, Josh. I'm Josh. Um, I'm a software engineer at Diagrid. So I'm a uh, project maintainer for Cert Manager. I've been working on that project for quite a number of years. And uh, yeah, more recently working a lot on Dapper. But yeah, today we're going to talk about Cert Manager. Yeah, um, so I hope you're all, all here to hear the answer to the question. Cert Manager, can it do spiffy? Um, so, without further ado, let's try and answer that question. Do you want to do the slides? Because if I go sure, close yeah, to yeah. that, then I've got the, yeah, yeah. the problem. So, I am a Cert Manager user. Please put your hands up if you've used Cert Manager. Yeah, there we go. See, it's one of those tools where you know that like, you're going to get a good response. Um, anyone that's heard of Cert Manager and wants to know a little bit more about it? If the, answer is, yeah, if the answer is yes, we've got a booth. I believe it's at K9, like the dog, easy to remember. Um, some of my colleagues at Jetsack are here as well, and they can help you along your way. So I'm a Cert Manager user, and my journey with Cert Manager started about three or four years ago. I was in my office, um, in, in my, my cubicle at VMware. Um, it was a dark, dreary evening, and I spent many hours trying to get my GKE cluster to expose my sock shop service to the public internet so I could show my parents, even though they have absolutely no interest. But there, there we go. Sorry, Mum and Dad. Um, I came up with this message, and of course, like, if you want to look professional to all your friends and family, this isn't exactly what you want. Off the, off, off the face of it, as I was still learning, I didn't know why, but it was something to do with a certificate. Apparently, I needed a certificate to get this message to go away. What an absolute bother. So as any good engineer does, I went back to Google. And I asked Google, how do I solve this problem? On GKE. If you're on GKE, there's this tool called um, Google Managed SSL, which directly integrates into Kubernetes on GKE, um, and has some custom CRDs to help you um, vend and mint certificates into your ingress controllers to get that horrible nasty message to go away. Unfortunately, I didn't have much success. Um, I spent many hours trying to get this to work um, and to no avail. Um, yeah, it was, it was without, without, um, yeah, without exaggeration, an absolute nightmare. So as any really good engineer does, I stopped and go, well, how about another Google then? And I went ahead, did another Google, and I found a blog post. And it told me about the Contour Ingress Controller, which I was using at the time um, as I was at VMware, as a VMware project. But it also told me about this thing called Cert Manager um, that was run by these people at Jetstack. It also had like three steps, and it looked like it was going to be a, like a five-minute task. And I thought, you know, if this means it can work and I can just go home, that's amazing. Lo and behold, it worked literally like magic. All I needed to do was install the operator, which is a relatively easy task if you can use kubectl apply. And I set, it up, set up a cluster issue with Let's Encrypt, and I was ready to go. It literally worked like magic, and I felt like a wizard. Of course, though, I'm not a wizard, and I wasn't the wizard in this case. In this case, the real wizards and witches are the maintainers um, and creators of the Cert Manager project. Um, along with a couple of others. Of course, I was using Kubernetes, which automated it all and made it so seamless. And I also used the Let's Encrypt project. They were the people that were issuing me the certificates in the first place from their CA that they provide completely for free. All of this is the real magic. Um, and I was just the you know, lucky beneficiary of it all. So fast forward on my journey a little bit further. Um, I want to talk to you about authentication. Why do I want to talk about authentication? What about it? Well. The reason why, and before I move on, this is a lovely picture that I actually got created for me with Dali, if anyone's familiar with that. I think I typed something in like, um, engineer freaking out as they lose all their keys. Um, yeah, very reflective. You'll see it a few, a few more times. It's sort of like my anthem for this talk. Um, so what about authentication? Well, um, I forward, forward through in my journey a little bit further. I started dabbling with the home lab thing. Um, I had a Kubernetes cluster running in my kitchen that definitely wasn't doing any sort of online privacy, uh, sorry, online piracy of any kind. 
Definitely not. Um, I wanted it to connect to other services. I wanted to start using the public clouds and being all hip and cool. And I asked the question, on, again, on Google, how do I do that? Well, it said, you need a service account. And you also need a service account key. So I thought, well, there's a lovely UI to do that. Click, click, click. No problems. No questions asked. I went to this UI. It said that there's some security risk. I said, well, I've got nothing to hide. I'm not doing any online piracy. So anyone can access my stuff, right? So it's not a problem. So I went ahead and I created my key. Um, and it came up with status active. It even downloaded it automatically to my laptop. How could it be any easier? To make it even more easy, there's this lovely key expiry date right here. It told me that my key was available until 99.99. Like, I'm not even sure if the human race is going to be around in 99.99. And I guess we'll, I mean, hopefully, we'll never know. Um, but what that definitely means is long past my, my living life, um, unless um, technology uh, speeds up at an alarming rate, it will be available for people or me to use. Now, though, looking back, after spending a bit of time doing security, it's terrifying. Even worse than that, at the time, I thought, well, I've got a lovely GitHub repository. Why don't I just plop it in there as well? It's a private repository. No one can see it. It's fine, totally fine. So I did my Git ad, and lo and behold, two or three years later, there's this lovely tool called GitHub Autopilot. And all of a sudden, everyone's getting my, um, my, my uh, service account key that has project-wide privileges to do whatever they want, and jobs are good. Obviously, at the time, I couldn't have foreseen this. Um, and I honestly didn't care and didn't understand the repercussions, but this is a disaster. Moving on a little bit further, this is sort of at the point where I started to become a consultant. I was working for a company now, and like people expect me to do things the right way and do it like you know securely. Um, so I was working on Google Cloud's GKE for a customer again, and I came across this lovely feature in GKE called Google Cloud Workload Identity. I configure some stuff in Google Cloud I am, and I add an annotation. All of a sudden, I can just start firing API requests from my pod to Google Cloud anywhere I want, and it lets me do whatever I want, provided that the uh, permissions of my linked um, service account in Google Cloud allows me to. Again, it's magic. In this case, though, there's one main drawback to this. Of course, I was running in Google Cloud's GKE, and I was connecting to Google Cloud services. And while it's a very pretty, colorful garden, it is a walled garden. I can't just start firing those API requests and setting up workload identity seamlessly straightforward out the box um, on any Kubernetes cluster or service running all over the shop, for that matter. What if I'm in a different cloud? What if it's my Raspberry Pi at home? It's not that simple. So at this point, someone says, oh, yeah, but you can use a password manager for that. Sorry, a secret manager, rather. You've got some lovely tools like um, the Google Managed One and the AWS Secrets Manager and HashiCorp Vault that you'll all be familiar with. And I know it's not. It's not as simple as a question to ask, but I asked myself the question when I started using it, and it actually got quite complicated quite quickly. Where do I store the secret that lets me access the secrets? This was a question that I'd been given answers to, and for full disclosure, there are some really elegant solutions in the HashiCorp Vault tool that allow you to do this seamlessly in a TM, secure way. But still, it's a problem that I think, in my journey, the entire time hasn't quite made sense. And hopefully, it, I really hope it shouldn't involve more long-lived static keys, right? Well, unfortunately, in some cases, if you do it wrong, it actually does. Totally scary. So let's move on a little bit, and hopefully this is what you're all here for. What if there was a world where all of this could be done seamlessly, where having to use secrets to authenticate was just a thing of the past? Well, hopefully it is that simple, and I'd say hopefully. I'd like to introduce you to the Secure Production Identity Framework for everyone. It's for you, it's for you, it's for everyone. Um, obviously, that's a horrible long name, and the maintainers did us a massive favor and called it Spiffy for short. But Spiffy essentially is that promise. It's a framework, that, an open source framework that defines a standard for defining what a workload or a machine identity is. So what does that actually look like in practice? Well. Let's come back to my Raspberry Pi in my home, in my kitchen, and we have my Kubernetes pod. What's its identity? Well, it might have a DNS name in the cluster's internal DNS, but it definitely doesn't have anything as good as this, right? So it's kind of embarrassing. That actually is me. This is my currently active provisional driver's license. I know it looks absolutely nothing like me. I was going for like a Justin Bieber look back in, I think it was like 20, 2012, when this was taken. Um, a long time has passed, but you can see that 
if I want to go, go to a nightclub, if I'm going on my first date and hopefully my date doesn't see the, the ID, it's totally embarrassing, um, I present this to the person and that is my identity. What if we could have the same thing? Of course, not like this. This is more like a JWT where it's totally a secret and um, if it gets leaked, it could be a problem, um, which we'll come on to a bit later. Um, but what if we had something like this for the Kubernetes pod? So what would that look like? Well, we have, in this case, like uh, a document for the workload. And you'll see at the bottom, there's this sort of string that says something spiffy um, colon slash slash. So what is that spiffy colon slash slash? Well, if you go forward a slide, um, let's come back to my Kubernetes pod. So I have a document just on the top right inside of the pod that's within the pod, and that is called an SVID. That is a spiffy verifiable identity document. Inside of that verif verifiable identity document, this is the pod's equivalent to my horrible provisional driver's license, um, we have a spiffy ID. A spiffy ID is a URI format which in case it, it contains information about that workload. It has information about the workload itself um, on the extension and where the host is in the URI. It has the trust domain. So the trust domain is pretty much to the discretion of an organization as to how they want to define it. But it is essentially a security boundary. If you consider that um, pods in a, in a cluster or services in a set of infrastructure have a set of public um, trust routes, um, some trust bundles in the X509 world that they trust, then a trust domain is essentially a set of workloads that have the same definition of trust across, across the, the domain. So what would this look like in real life? Well, in my kitchen, for instance, it might be tom.cluster. All my pods in the cluster have the same um, public trust bundles, so therefore they're in the same trust domain, um, and they're within my tom.cluster organization. Um, I've got my pod, of course, and I could just say like the name of the pod or the pod identity, but really I want to know who it is that's running it, right? In this case, of course, my pod is being run by a service account. So it probably makes sense to make the spiffy ID reflect the service account name that's running the pod. So that's really helpful if I want to identify what it is, if I'm not um, the pod itself. Also, I might want some extra information in the Kubernetes world. So I might also want the namespace that it's in. In this case, service account pod01 is inside of the namespace default and it's running the pod. Brilliant. Seems pretty, pretty good. So how does that actually work in real life? How do I use that SVID document, my spiffy ID embedded within this document? Well, I've got my pod, and that pod has a spiffy ID, and I'm talking to another pod, except this time, it's not in my Raspberry Pi in my kitchen. It's actually on Josh's cluster. So Josh's cluster is a separate trust domain of josh.cluster, and it is service account pod02 in the default namespace. Of course, for this all to work, um, the pod, when it's communicating with the other pod, needs to present its spiffy ID to prove its identity. And it really needs two things. One I'm going to focus on here. Of course, it needs some policy. So there needs to be some policy on each side, on Tom's cluster, that Tom's cluster should trust Josh's cluster. And in the case of Josh's cluster, Josh's, uh, Josh's cluster should trust Tom's. And therefore, it can distinguish that the spiffy ID should be trusted or not. It also, in the X509 case, of course, needs the public trust root certificate. But we'll come on to that in a minute. So provided that the policy is, um, provided that the ID meets the policy that's been written and the certificate itself or the ID can be verified cryptographically, they can talk no problem. Brilliant, right? What if we mix things up a little bit more? So instead of my Kubernetes pod, I'm gonna take that away um, and I'm gonna switch that out with AWS and specifically Amazon S3. I've got my Kubernetes pod running in Google Cloud on GKE and I want to communicate with Amazon S3. So how would that look? Well, of course, I could just do um, the long-lived static key credential. Um, please feel brave and put your hand up if you've ever used a long-lived static key credential to talk to a public cloud service. Any, yeah, see, right? Like It's one of those things that we all do it, and we say, we're not going to do it in production until that day comes when you've got 100 things to do, and you're like, I'll come back to it later. Um, so we could do this, but of course we've been through this. It's absolutely terrifying, right? So let's take that away. What if, again, we just have our spiffy ID that's inside, or SVID rather, that's inside of our Kubernetes pod, and we use that to communicate with AWS? What do we need? We need the same thing. We just need to be able to configure AWS to say, we should trust 
that spiffy ID coming from Tom's kitchen in his Raspberry Pi cluster to access S3, and maybe some extra information like which S3 bucket it can communicate with and um, also like what it can do with the S3 bucket. This all might think, feel very theoretical, but I promise you, um, you're gonna be able to see whether I'm lying to you or not. I'm gonna have a full demo from Josh later that's gonna do exactly that with AWS. So hold tight. I promise the theory will end at some point. So hopefully you're like, this is awesome. What do I do to get set up and get started? Well, the reference implementation of Spiffy, um, the main tool to use here is called Spire. And Spire is a fantastic tool. It does everything that encompasses what Spiffy is as a, as a framework. I don't have the time to go through it in detail today. We've given a good link to a talk from a previous KubeCon that goes through Spire in detail. But essentially, some of the main advantages of Spire that it allows you to issue SVIDs in two document formats. That is both JWT and X509. So dependent on what you're trying to communicate with, you can use that different document type, and hopefully you should be supported. Second of all, it can verify SVIDs of other workloads. So if the pod is configured to, it can receive that SVID, and then go to Spire to get it um, verified. It's fantastic. It also, and this is probably the main advantage to Spire in my opinion, is it has an emerging ecosystem of plugins to integrate with other tools and services. Of course, Spiffy is dependent on being able to talk and do everything Spiffy with everything. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, it's gonna become incredibly cumbersome and there's gonna be limitations all over the place. So this is a great advantage here. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows, of course. Um, what are the main disadvantages? Well, of course, as I mentioned with the verification and some other stuff, calling Spire actually needs changes to your application. Also for enterprises, um, especially in the X509 situation, you might have a private CA that you want to have to be vending out your um, SVIDs in an X509 format, for example. That is another point of required integration with private PKI. And it's another tool that your PKI team will have to um, manage um, and, and sort of integrate with. Finally, it's another stateful service. So out of the box, Spire comes with SQL Lite. Of course, in production situations, you probably want to back that with a, a production-ready database like MySQL or Postgres. This, of course, is, is more maintenance, and anyone in this room that has had to manage um, stateful services has probably experienced this pain. Um, maybe if you're wanting to try out Spiffy and get, just get started, this might not be the right route for you. So hold on a minute. I've said a lot about X509 and Spiffy, and that sort of brings me back to the start of the talk. So, Cert Manager exists, right? And you've all, a lot of you put your hands up and said that you're using it already. So, I sort of wondered to myself and others, others within the team, why can't we just use Cert Manager for this? Um, if you wanna, yeah, is this the moment? I think this is the <laughs> moment, everyone. I'm gonna end my part of the talk here. I'm gonna hand you over to one of our core Cert Manager maintainers, Josh, who's going to tell you whether this is possible or not. Do you wanna go ahead? Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I can no go problem. ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, like Tom was saying, um, I think nearly all of you put your hand up um, uh, when you said you had Cert Manager already installed. Um, so yeah, some advantages of why we'd want to use Cert Manager. Um, uh, yeah, it's easy, it's accessible, it's probably already installed in, in your cluster. Um, it provides um, it signs certificates, right? So it provides those um, uh, documents in X509 format, um, and yeah, it makes rotating them um, and automating it simple. Um, and yes, yeah, supports a wide variety of certificates. Um, so you know, you're probably familiar with the, the kind of um, Acme kind of Lex Encrypt use case, but you know, we also have support for Vault or all of the kind of public clouds and, and, and the rest of it. Um, great, so the next thing um, to introduce, um, so we want to get, so, you know, Cert Manager does um, X509 certificates, but we're talking about Spiffy here, and we want to kind of deliver certificates, uh, Spiffy certificates, SPIDs, um, to pods that are kind of Spiffy compliant and actually attested by some kind of workload identity um, that, that we can trust and, and kind of actually use for, for kind of some kind of authentication. So this is where CSI driver Spiffy comes in. So um, the uh, CSI in, in Kubernetes, if you're not too familiar, so CSI is the way that um, how, um, you know, any kind of storage um, works in Kubernetes. So CSI is a set of protocols and, and an interface um, that is uh, kind of used by the kubelet to talk to any kind of storage manager. So if you're familiar with, if, you're, if you've used kind of NFS or some kind of cloud solution, um, even using kind of secrets and config maps, we're all kind of using the CSI driver interface. So the CSI driver is spiffy essentially are writing a kind of cert manager 
kind of opinionated CSI driver um, that we can kind of provide a volume kind of solution uh, to Kubernetes. Um, and then what that means is practice is that, you know, I have a pod, I say I want a cert manager volume on it, and cert manager is going to go ahead and sign a certificate and make that available for, for kind of mounting directly to the pod. And uh, so there's spiffy um, kind of flavor of this specifically. Um, we'll create um, you know, spiffy compliance certificates based on the pod's identity. And we'll go into a bit later about how that works. Um, and of course, it's going to be kind of silently, um, yeah, silently kind of transparently renewing that certificate in the background for that, for that pod. Um, nice things about using the kind of CSI driver spiffy and um, the private key never leaves the node. If you're familiar with cert manager and you've certificates before, obviously the, the kind of certificate and private key get stored to a secret. That's accessible by the API server. It's kind of, yeah, a mute point. We're talking about kind of then kind of getting the kind of static credential kind of space. Um, so, um, yeah, this is pretty, pretty nice. So the CSI driver will create a tempfs mount. So that leaves it in the kind of pods memory, never leaves the node. Each pod has a unique private key and certificate. There's no extra CRDs to install with CSI driver Spiffy. Um, you've all kind of already got set manager installed. This is just another deployment to run in your server, uh, in your cluster, um, and it's a kind of stateless service. And lastly, there's no extra databases. So Tom was just kind of describing about the pain points around, you know, right, running, you know, stateful uh, services in Kubernetes and Kubernetes and databases and whatnot. Um, we're using set manager, so we're relying on CRDs um, and and we're you know, using the kind of API server as our state store. So, um, yeah, no extra databases needed. Um, so, server manager can only do X, Y, and right? Um, but that's good. It's better than JWT. Um, X, Y, and nine, you know, is inherently a kind of asymmetric cryptography. You don't kind of share your private exponent. Um, JWT is um, a kind, of a, a kind of a password, essentially. Um, so, they're susceptible to things like replay attacks. Um, so X509 kind of gets around that problem. Um, also, with in the kind of spiffy case, the, the kind of spiffy authentication authorization is happening a lot sooner in the TLS handshake, um, and that has some kind of security benefits. The bad thing, of course, if you kind of ever um, kind of uh, try to implement private PKA in your organization or kind of at home or whatever, um, yeah, trust distribution becomes a bit of a pain point. We do have a talk um, tomorrow. Of, Kind of uh, colleague Ashley um, is going to be talking about trust distribution in Kubernetes, so that'll be definitely a good one to, to look at. Um, and yeah, obviously helps with this problem uh, of going this route has. So going on to the CSI driver Spiffy, I won't spend too long um, on the um, uh, kind of the, the kind of flow diagram of how it's working. But uh, the bottom, we need to talk about the bottom title, right? So if you're familiar with Spiffy or kind of read any of the kind of documentation or anything like that, um, it's all based on some kind of workload attestation. So in order to give a workload an identity, it needs to prove its identity. Um, so we're in the Kubernetes world. So what's our bottom title? It's the Kubernetes um, kind of platform itself. Um, so when using the CSI driver Spiffy, What's happening here is, you know, if we say, you know, our user here has submitted a pod um, and uh, or a deployment or what have you, it gets committed to the API server. The API server reconciles it. This is kind of Kubernetes 101. Um, it gets <laughs> scheduled to a kubelet, um, and uh, yeah, the pod gets scheduled. Um, then the kubelet is going to then look at the kind of vo what volumes the pod um, has um, kind of specified. You can say, oh, it needs this secret from here. I'm going to grab that from the API server, yada, yada. Oh, I've got a cert manager one here. I need to talk to the cert manager CSI driver. So that now it's going to start talking to uh, our service. What that service is then going to do um, is, yeah, receive that, that, that CSI call. So it's called no published volume um, in the spec. And this would basically be the kubelet saying to the, to the CSI driver that, you know, um, we need a volume for this pod. Um, and also importantly, it's going to send a copy of the pod's um, service account to the CSI driver Spiffy, and we'll come up to that later, but that's important to kind of do the attestation. Next, the driver is going to create our certificate key pair. Um, so this is a kind of, you know, your standard kind of X509 certificate signing request. It's also going to be inside that request, it's going to be um, putting the Spiffy ID into kind of a Spiffy certificate, right? Um, and um, importantly, it's going to be setting that Spiffy ID to the service account of the pod. And we know what the service account name is and what namespace are in based on the call that we made from, based on the, the, what the cube, cube was, right? Um, next, we, the CSI driver then creates the actual certificate request resource, um, and that's the cert manager resource. Um, cert manager then picks that up. We then have another service called an approver, and this is the kind of attestation bit. Um, and the end result and what this approver is checking is that we have a cert manager's different request um, created by 
the pod because the CSR driver has impersonated the pod when it made the request and the approver will then check that the contents of the request matches the uh, requester as it were. So it's just a kind of, yeah, it's a check to make sure that the contents of the SPIFI ID kind of match what pod identity requested for it. CSR driver then will fetch the signed certificate once it's been signed by cert manager and then go ahead and make the, the volume mount, mount it in for the pod and then, you know, once the containers start, as long as they have the volume mount, then, then they'll be available, uh, yeah, for the, for the container to run. And this flow is obviously happening on startup, so the containers won't start until the volume is ready, just like however, uh, how other volumes behave in Kubernetes, um, but also the CSR driver will obviously renew this in the background kind of transparently to the pod. Please stop with the slides. <laughs> Show me the demo already. Um, so let me put that down. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I guess. Cool. You still hear me? Yeah. Um, so we have actually created a um, kind of flavor or kind of a, we've created a fork of the CSI driver spiffy um, that we want to submit to upstream. And basically what it is doing is we are just before writing the certificate and key pair, um, we are going to authenticate to AWS using that um, SFID document. Um, and what's quite cool here is we're using our Kubernetes identity that could be running anywhere. So in our case, it's going to be running in a kind cluster on my laptop right here, but we're authenticating to AWS using that identity. And what's important to like understand here is that our Spiffy ID our spiffy identity that could be running anywhere um, yeah, can authenticate to the service. It means we have like a consistent identity plane across all of our infrastructure. And that's where like spiffy becomes really, really powerful and you have this kind of consistency, consistent kind of policy view, regardless of where your, like, your, your infrastructure or your workloads are actually running. Um, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to show you the kind of AWS kind of portal first, um, just to kind of show very quickly like generally what I've got going on. So we've imported our certificate bundle. That's what Tom was talking about before, where the workload needs to, or AWS needs to kind of trust our workload when it connects to it. Um, so yeah, we just have to import that in there. Next up, we have created a role. So I've given it kind of like a generic kind of S3 bucket access. Um, and importantly, in the role definition here, in the kind of what AWS calls the trust relationship, uh, we point it to that CA bundle I just showed you, um, and we also importantly um, doing a string match here on Spiffy ID. So, like Tom was talking about before, I'm using the trust domain here, cert manager dot 2023, um, and I'm looking for Spiffy like IDs that are in the namespace SA kind of format. Um, so this is a kind of like first pass to kind of assume a role. And then I'm not super familiar with I am. I'm not like a whiz kid. Um, I do. Uh, so hopefully this, so don't copy this, paste this basically, because it might not be the best way to do things, but it seems to be quite elegant for me. Um, I've got an, another, what they call a trust profile, um, which will, uh, when authenticating, will, will um, go through this. And the, the AWS has this thing called a session policy, which is basically like another filter that you can put a, when you assume a session, something, a uh, session token, um, then it will go through the session policy. And the point of the session policy that I have here is that I'm, I'm in a situation where I have two services running, one of them needs to read write to an S3 bucket, one of them just needs to read. So in this uh, service A, I've obviously given it a get and put um, permissions to the S3 bucket to this S3 bucket, QCon 2023, bidding open for that S3 bucket name. Um, uh, so yes, this is this uh, kind of string match here. This policy is saying that um, all, all spiffy IDs in the namespace app A will basically be able to assume this role. Um, and then on this side, we've got an app B namespace um, and they'll be able to assume the role of just get object, but they won't be able to put anything. Um, this is, yeah, it's kind of a bit contrived, but the idea is that we can have services um, that are, you know, the workloads that are represented by their spiffer identity and we can write policy in a kind of, um, yeah, in, in the same way. Um, it's interesting to note that, as we understand, AWS are the only cloud provider that support X509 authentication. Um, uh, no other cloud supports that, and that's massive. Yeah, so putting it in short, Google Cloud, if you're listening to this, <laughs> can you please do this? Please? Thank you. And Azure, of course. Um, so, yeah, uh, just to quickly show you um, that, um, yeah, it does work, um, is, it, I'm in my service A here, 
So as you'd expect, hopefully this works. Um, the pod is running here. The uh, cert manager uh, volume um, is mounted along with the AWS uh, credentials, which are kind of silently being requested uh, in the background using that SVID. Um, you can see here in the service A is allowed to copy from the bucket. It's also allowed to paste to the bucket. Hopefully the internet. Come on. Yeah, good. Right. So it didn't error. So that's like good. Um, and then we can see on the service B side, we can also copy from the pod. Go on. Whoa, this is cloud native. Okay. And then we can, if we try and write to the pod on service B. Wow, guys, yes. <laughs> so uh, we got an error message, but that's correct, right? Because if we looked at our policy that we just defined before, um, we got an, uh, we didn't allow the service B to, to, to write to the pod, right? So it's a good thing we're getting access denied. Cool. Um, so back to the slides. Having said all this, um, yeah, so CSI, Java, Spiffy might al always be the best fit for you, um, but Spire might. So um, as uh, we were talking about before, um, Spire has full support for JWT, Cert Manager doesn't support that. It enables workload attestation outside of the Kubernetes context. Um, so you know, if you're running in a VM or you're another some, some kind of other infrastructure uh, context that might be not be appropriate or you want some kind of more, um, some other attestation method, maybe you don't even trust your Kubernetes platform, then the Cert Manager CSI driver Spiffy might not be appropriate. And uh, Spire obviously implements the workload APIs that the cert manager, cert manager does, and cert manager just delivers the kind of SVID documents to your to your workload. However, um, whatever you do with authentication, uh, use Spiffy because Spiffy is really good, and uh, yeah, it succeeds. Um, I might add if you're um, yeah, I might add if you're already using cert manager, then CSI driver Spiffy is the perfect place to start. Yeah. Great. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Um, there's a QR link to the GitHub where the um, AWS fork of the CSI driver Spiffy can be found. Um, so you can try running that yourself. Um, and we yeah, hope to kind of submit that for upstream or create some kind of official cert manager um, repository for that. Um, you can kind of find the work going on there. And then um, as Tom was talking about before, there's a QR code there to uh, learn more about Spire. So that'll take you to a great talk uh, from the Spire maintainers to, to talk about. Um, spire there, so yeah. Uh, but that's that's it. Thank you, Thank very, you very much for coming. I think there's like two minutes left for questions, but um, yeah, or we can. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'll bring over the mic. Actually, it's probably the best way to do this. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if it's possible to use labels to identify, for example, some specific four pods with, yeah, like a selector, you know. Like, for example, in case of a Postgres cluster, we've got a primary and the standby identified by labels. It would be good to, for example, allow the standby to read and the primary to write. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, when it comes to, uh, to things like that, stuff. yeah. So, like, ideally, like, the whole system should be flexible enough for you to describe those kind of scenarios and write policy to like allow that. Um, the CSI driver Spiffy today is all based on the pod service account um, and it's tricky to change that because um, that's kind of cryptographically attestable by the driver and the API server and whatnot. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, we can chat about that later. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions? I'll come here. So there is a way to integrate Share Manager with uh, external VM, uh, with a Spire server external, uh, or uh, I don't know if there is a, some possible way to implement uh, some kind of mutatiles between uh, pod and VMs. Uh, yeah, so there is an integration with Spire and Cert Manager today. So Spire can be used, so Cert Manager can be used as a, uh, what they call a, Certificate authority provider, I think that's the terminology they use. Um, so there is kind of a link today. That you could kind of, um, but the way that that works is Spire um, is required to have the intermediate certificate inside Spire, which is not the case with Cert Manager. That's where the two differ. But um, yeah, Cert Manager just is not appropriate for VM workloads. It just needs to be in a Kubernetes context. Yeah. 
for it to work. Any more for any more? Yeah, sure. Um, if you could just pass the mic along. Do, do you know, do you envision something that it's uh, interacting directly with the cloud provider, for example, AWX, Azure, or Google? Because as a security savvy, I hope that no company is actually putting the wildcard into the, into the identity because uh, I can spawn uh, whatever service I want and get automatic access. So do you envision that the CSI will interact directly there to configure um, on demand basically the, the, the certificates? Yeah, that could be a very interesting solution. Yeah, yeah, that might be appropriate for you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is all, and again, like, um, hopefully this whole system uh, should be flexible enough to you to kind of manage your risk profile appropriately. And maybe, yeah, using wildcards and strings like that is probably not what you want to be doing in production. Um, you probably want some kind of service to do some kind of pre-registration to, you know, dynamically write your policies in some kind of same way. That totally makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, it's worth noting as well, when we were preparing the demo for this, the, the AWS functionality that we've put in here, um, of course, it's available on the GitHub repository. It's all very new, um, but upon doing it, I was thinking just that, like um, adding that extra, extra layer of configuration where um, I can make that link and somehow, based on some, some configuration written, it will map to the AWS role specifically. Um, but it's not something we've done yet. It's something we'd be interested in doing, I guess. Yeah, sorry. I'll bring over the mic just so it's on record. I just want to say that some of the challenges that you might face is the permission required uh, in order for, for the CSI in order to do that configuration. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like company like ours, we don't really trust a lot uh, mm -hmm. some of the third-party providers and so on and so forth. So we want to try to limit uh, the range of permissions that they have on the IDP, so yeah. the identity provider, in this case AWS or, yeah. uh, or, or Azure sort of control what they're capable of doing or not because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they really want to have uh, full control and that's not really something that uh, we gig out uh, for free. So yeah. that's the problem. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious. How are we doing for time? Do we have time for one more question? We're, We're done? done? We're done? Well, cool. thank you very much, everyone. And again, the CERT Manager team, thank you.